Greetings, my name is Jess Fedorowitz. I'm a faculty member uh, in the College of Medicine Department of Psychiatry and College of Public Health Department of Epidemiology. I'm pleased to be able to talk to you today about major mental illnesses, specifically schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in older adults. Before we begin, I have a few disclosures. Uh, my research is currently funded by the National, Institutes of mental, National Institute of Mental Health, NARSAD, the Nellie Ball Trust, uh, the Institute for Clinical Translational Science at the University of Iowa and CDA, CHDI Foundation, uh, which is a foundation for Huntington's disease research. I do work on some of my colleagues' clinical trials. These colleagues are neuropsychologists, neuropsycholo and I serve as a study physician. Um, these studies are funded by NeuroSearch, by Talent Enzymatic Therapy, and the National Cent Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, as well as the National Institutes of Health. We have sort of some broad and ambitious goals for today's talk, including to review the diagnostic criteria in general for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. We'll talk about some unique features in the assessment of these conditions in older adults, as well as describe the course of illness uh, in the aging population. Then we're going to conclude by talking about ways we can more effectively manage these conditions. And importantly, and especially important in older adults, monitor for the adverse effects of treatments for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. We'll begin with a case presentation. This is a case that was published about five years ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry that well illustrates several points uh, for this talk. The patient is a 60-year-old married male. He has no past psychiatric history, and his medical history has been significant only for high blood pressure. He presents with insomnia, increased energy, pressured speech, and that is talking so fast that he can't be interrupted, tangential thinking, and grandiose delusions. In more specific details, he claimed to have very close relationships with many women. Had no ev there was no evidence to support this, and he was, in fact, spending several hundreds of dollars of cl on clothing to, quote, catch the lady's eyes, unquote. This was a clear change uh, from his premorbid behaviors. Another, in another clear change from his premorbid behaviors, he had his eyebrow and tongue pierced in an attempt to make himself more attractive. He had several uh, unusual ideas, such as claiming he was a sounder, meaning that he could see into the future, and that he had the ability to run the United Nations. And he complained that the world around him was too slow. The patient also described auditory hallucinations, hearing music, hearing television commercials. He denied any alcohol or illicit drugs. Family history was notable only for a brother with panic disorder. The patient had been married and divorced twice and had no children. Given the title of the talk and, and, and the details in this presentation, it's clear that this patient is going through a mood episode, and for that matter, a mood elevation episode. And it's worth reviewing what are the different mood episodes that can occur in bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is characterized by episodes of mood elevation, typically alternating with episodes of depression. So the episodes we're going to define in the coming slides are mania, hypomania, and major depression. Mania represents a period of abnormally elevated, expansive, or irritable mood, lasting at least one week. Although if hospitalization is, is required, it need not last a full week for the diagnosis. Um, if the mood is irritable, four additional symptoms are required. If the mood is elevated or expansive, three additional symptoms are required. And the symptoms of mania include grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, being more talkative, distractible, a flight of ideas or racing thoughts, increase in goal-directed activities, and engaging in pleasurable activities with potential for painful consequences. Our patient in this example appears to meet criteria for mania. Hypomania is characterized as being a lower intensity, uh, but similar syndrome. And so we have the same symptoms, uh, though only four days is required. In the criteria for mania, an impairment in function is required. There just needs to be a change in functioning with hypomania, and in fact, it can be an improvement uh, in functioning. It need not have the impairment. If psychosis is present or hospitalization is needed, the episode is considered mania. Major depressive episodes um, 
involve periods of sustained depressed mood or anhedonia. Anhedonia being decreased interest in or ability to enjoy one's usual activities. At least one of those must be present, as well as, an, as an additional four symptoms, which may include changes in weight or appetite, insomnia or hypersomnia, psychomotor retardation, there's a, being slowed down, something that could be observable by the clinician or others, fatigue or low energy, feelings of worthlessness, low self-esteem or guilt, low concentration and thoughts of death. Uh, according to the DSM, this should be present for a two-week period. We often distinguish bipolar subtypes, and this, this, this distinction uh, is important for a variety of reasons, and one of which is that the course of illness is different. Treatment response may also be different, although there's limited evidence for treatments in bipolar 2. In bipolar 1 disorder, an individual has experienced one or more manic episodes. They need not have had, had major depressive episodes for diagnosis, although unipolar mania which is uh, bipolar 1 without depression, is quite rare uh, over the long term. Bipolar 2 is characterized by major depressive episodes and hypomanic episodes, or at least one hypomanic episode, rather than an actual manic episode. Uh, in an analysis of the collaborative depression study, which followed over 900 individuals uh, for up to 31 years, uh, we found that individuals with bipolar 1 are much more prone to mania. And in fact, as illustrated in this figure, they have mania four times as often as individuals with bipolar 2 have hypomania. And those with type 2 bipolar disorder are more prone to depression. And in fact, have clinically significant depressive symptoms about twice as often as those with type 1. So the course of illness uh, for these uh, conditions is distinct. They also tend to breed true uh, in family studies. If we think about what is the actual impairment or disability caused by the bipolar disorders, uh, we find uh, that disability increases incrementally uh, as the burden of depressive or manic symptoms increases. Symptoms of depression are as or more disabling than manic symptoms, and even subsyndromal depressive symptoms, that is, depressive symptoms that don't meet the threshold for diagnosis uh, in DSM, are disabling. And between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2, bipolar 2, of course, as we described before, having a more chronic course with regards to depression, there are similar disabilities by symptom level, with the exception of hypomania, which in bipolar 2 is thought to, if anything, increase function, uh, though is associated with some decreases in function in bipolar 1 in aggregate. This following figure, which was created by one of my students, illustrates the differences between these mood disorders. So the first curve here illustrates a unipolar or major depression. And you can see episodes, an episodic pattern of episodes of major depression or even uh, milder symptoms that we might call a minor depression. Bipolar 1 is characterized by periods of mood elevation that reach into the severity level that we would think of as consistent with mania. These are often followed uh, by depressive episodes, and there may be periods of normal mood in between. Individuals with bipolar 2 do not reach this threshold for mania and, as illustrated in this figure, tend to spend more time in depressive episodes. It's important to note, and, and this will be true even working with older adults, that those that have major depression may be at risk of developing bipolar disorder later in their life. In a recent analysis I did of 550 individuals from the same collaborative depression study, uh, these individuals had major depression. They were recruited between 1978 and 1981, at, at which time they were a mean age of 38 years. Over up to 31 years of follow-up, a quarter of the individuals ultimately developed hypomania or mania. This figure shows the survival curves uh, for progression to bipolar disorder in major depression. And as you can see here, especially early in the course of illness, uh, a fair number of people at a, at, a, at, a, at a more rapid rate develop bipolar disorder. However, however even later in follow-up, in the period corresponding to 1,040 weeks represents approximately 20 years, so this would be where the mean age of our sample is now getting close to 60, there are still some individuals that go on to develop mania or hypomania 
even late into their course of illness. So one of the key messages that I would underscore from this data is that continued monitoring for the possibility of progression of bipolar disorder over the long-term course of major depressive disorder is necessary. We shouldn't just screen for mania and hypomania at intake, but we should continue to look for it in individuals that we're working with that have major depression. The other uh, major mental illness that we're going to be talking about today is schizophrenia. The diagnostic criteria for this, according to the DSM-4 text revision, include more than two of the following symptoms present during a one-month period, with some disturbance present for at least six months. And these symptoms include delusions. Delusions are false, fixed, and idiosyncratic beliefs that are ego-involving. Let's break down that definition. A false belief is clear. A fixed belief means that the patient is convinced that that belief is true. Uh, as Carl Jasper said, it is impervious to experience and counter-argument. That is, no matter what someone tells them or what happens in their life, they're still 100% convinced that this is true. That is one of the key defining features. The term idiosyncratic is referring to the fact uh, that this deviates from the person's uh, uh, cultural or social norms. Uh, this can be difficult to tease out in some patients, and often information from family can be helpful in teasing that out. And I also use the word ego-involving to specify um, that patients are preoccupied by these beliefs. Hallucinations are a perception without a stimulus. This may involve seeing or hearing things that aren't there. And the defining feature for a hallucination is that it has all the qualities of a perception. So you can ask your patient a variety of questions to tease out, does this seem like a perceptual experience? Does it seem like you watching this slideshow right now or hearing my voice uh, at this time? Um, oftentimes, psychiatrists will ask if the voice comes from inside or outside the head. And if it's inside the head, they'll assume it's a hallucination. This is really a simplification of this. If outside the head, it is what Carl Jaspers uh, once referred to as external objective space akin to a perception where I can localize a sound as coming from the corner of the room or something that I'm seeing is being in front of me. However, it's certainly possible for things inside one's head to also have the quality of a perception, such as I could be hearing a sound coming from my tooth and be able to say that this sound is coming from right here or from just inside my ear. While those locations are inside my head, we would certainly describe that as objective space when I can localize it to a specific location. The next two symptoms are related to disorganization. So we may see disorganized speech or disorganized or catatonic behaviors. We may also see negative symptoms. This may include affective flattening, uh, a paucity for speech, or low motivation. And the some signs of the disturbance should be present for at least six months. Some have broken down the symptoms of schizophrenia into some specific dimensions. And depending on who has done this, uh, there will be three to five main symptom categories. The simpler three-category approach involves psychotic symptoms, and that is the degree to which delusions or hallucinations are present. The next is disorganized symptoms, and that is the degree to which disorganized th speech, disorganized behavior, or inappropriate affect is present. And the last category is negative symptoms, and that is the degree to which negative symptoms, such as a flat affect, not speaking much, or low motivation are present. The five category models often include some degree of depressive or manic symptoms, uh, as mood symptoms are common or not uncommon in schizophrenia. Now I'd like to proceed to talking about unique features in the assessment of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia in older adults. First, we should think about what is a differential diagnosis of psychosis. That would be delusions or hallucinations both of which can present with either bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Some of the most common conditions that will present with this include delirium and dementia, which are very important to rule out in a patient that presents with psychosis. Psychotic mood disorders, broadly defined to include major depression and bipolar disorder, are the next most common cause. Schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorders are also relatively common. We also need to think about delusional disorders, uh, substance abuse, and symptoms of other neurological conditions such as Parkinson's disease. The age of onset of bipolar disorder typically occurs well before older age. 
As illustrated in this figure here, many of the people when they first develop bipolar disorder are young adults. But you will also notice in this figure that there are some individuals that are developing it later in life. And as you may recall from my prior data, that a number of patients with major depression will go on to progress to bipolar disorder even later in life. Overall, the mean age of onset for bipolar disorder is 21 years of age. Those studies of hospitalized uh, patients for bipolar disorder suggest that many, as, and as many as 29% in one study, uh, have ha had an onset greater than 50 years of age. Um, those with a late onset were more likely to be female, but otherwise appeared pretty similar in regards to medical comorbidity, utilization, and other sociodemographic factors. Let's go back to our case presentation of an individual presenting uh, later in life with a manic syndrome. Our patient had an unremarkable laboratory workup. Serum chemistries were normal, complete blood count, liver transaminases, thyroid function tests, a screen for syphilis, urine drug screen, alcohol, all of these were normal. Head imaging was performed, and on head imaging, a mass was seen in the patient's medial right temporal lobe. Uh, this was debulked by neurosurgery. The specific uh, diagnosis of the tumor was not reported in the publication. And the patient was started on medications for acute mania, specifically olanzapine, an antipsychotic, and divalprex, an anticonvulsant or mood stabilizer. So this patient presented with mania after having a brain tumor. And this has sometimes been called secondary mania, because at least as defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Bipolar disorder is considered to be an idiopathic condition, that is a condition not caused by drugs, alcohol, or a medical condition. Uh, Many in older adults commonly occur as secondary to identified medical causes, although there's limited data to suggest exactly how common is it and what proportion of these new onset cases could be deemed secondary. Uh, but brain lesion, including from stroke, is one cause, seizure activity, head injury, endocrine abnormalities, drug or alcohol use, which is something we too often forget about in older adults and certainly shouldn't be forgetting about, as well as infections, specifically infections of the central nervous system. Our patient had a brain lesions, and brain lesions have typically been located in the following areas, bilateral orbital frontal cortex, right basal and medial temporal lobe, basal ganglia, thalamus, right frontal temporal areas, so our patient's lesion location is pretty classic, uh, being located in the right uh, medial temporal lobe. So when do we get head imaging in patients that present with mania? And there are no specific practice guidelines addressing this, but there have been some pro published suggestions and recommendations. It has been suggested that we get head imaging in older adults if there's a change in their mental status that's new after the age of 50. So something new, a new behavior, a new symptom is coming up that wasn't present before. For any patients with new onset mania or psychosis, so if your patient is 65 years of age and they've never had mania before, that would be indication for head imaging. However, if they've had mania intermittently since they were in their early 20s, that may not be an indication. New onset psychosis, new onset delirium or dementia. If there's an association, of course, between symptoms and head injury or with the development of abnormalities on neurological exam. These would certainly be indications for imaging. How about the laboratory workup? I detailed some of the laboratory workup here. And these are some of the things that have been suggested for a laboratory workup in a patient with a new onset of psychotic symptoms. Complete metabolic panel, complete blood count, checking a TSH for thyroid, uh, RPR for syphilis, HIV testing, vitamin B12 and folate, a urine drug screen and serum alcohol. Uh, you can consider, uh, depending on the clinical presentation and the, and the uh, social or occupational history, whether it makes sense to get a heavy metal panel uh, or an EEG or electroencephalogram. So how about treatment in case with secondary mania? And this really depends what the cause of the secondary mania is. If it's something reversible, the patient may not require uh, long-term prophylactic treatment such as with a mood stabilizer. However, for some etiologies, uh, such as this brain lesion patient, it may continue. Or if a patient has a stroke where we're not going to be able to reverse the underlying cause, long-term treatment may be needed. Another question is for those that don't have secondary mania. So for the example of the patient that may present with mania that's had uh, episodes of mania intermittently since young adulthood. 
does the course of illness change with age? Does it get more severe? And this was studied in analysis of Clavin's depression study by Bill Coriel, who found that those with a younger age of onset uh, of bipolar disorder tended to have some increase in persistence of depressive symptoms with age. That is, they ended up spending more time depressed as they got older. But there seemed to be no change in the persistence of manic symptoms, and this effect did not appear to be seen in those that presented at an older age. Other, there's been also been concern for cognitive impairments and are those associated with and, and influenced by the conditions. Um, a number of case control studies have suggested greater degrees of cognitive impairment for individuals both with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia uh, when compared to healthy controls. And in one study of bipolar disorder that went three years, it suggested that this cognition also declined at a more rapid rate over time compared with controls. And so cognition uh, may potentially worsen. Let's move to the course of illness and, and progression for schizophrenia. Um, age of onset distributions also show the greatest risk uh, in young adulthood. But you'll see here in the figure, there are still incident cases that come that, that present even later in life. You'll also notice that the curve for women is shifted to the right, meaning that the age of onset for women uh, tends to be older, and especially as we get uh, later in life. How about the course of illness? How does that change over time? Um, we'll be getting to that, but the mean age of onset is, is as I mentioned, somewhat later. And the vast majority, or 85% of patients with schizophrenia were diagnosed before 45 years of age. Does it change over time? The positive symptoms, that is the delusions and hallucinations, do appear to improve uh, with age. However, the negative, disorganized symptoms, the data is less clear. Some studies have suggested that there's improvement. Other studies have found no change. And some studies have suggested a worsening uh, in negative symptoms. As far as cognitive impairments, again, schizophrenia is also associated with some nonspecific cognitive impairments. It's thought that these may be exacerbated by age-related declines. It's not clear if these declines are greater than would be expected in, in healthy controls. These cognitive impairments may be important because impairments in social function which is an important piece of the individual's function, may be associated with both the negative symptoms and any cognitive impairments that patients have. There's another important piece to addressing uh, these major mental illnesses, uh, particularly, though not exclusively, to older adults. And that is patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia tend to have more medical comorbidities than you would expect uh, from a general population of older adults. And in mixed age studies, patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have been found to have approximately twice the risk of dying. And so that is the number of people in these samples that die um, over a certain period of time are about twice as many as you would expect to happen based on the age and gender uh, of those groups compared to the general population. The excess deaths, that is the deaths that happen more than, more than expected, uh, are mostly due to suicide and vascular disease. In fact, I've, I've estimated from prior studies that approximately two-thirds or more of the excess deaths are related to these two specific causes of death. This is data from a study by Osby that was performed in Sweden where they looked at more than 15,000 inpatients with bipolar disorder and followed them until a good number had died. And they looked at the number of excess deaths uh, in the sample. And as you can see here in this figure, the leading cause of excess death, accounting for approximately a third of the excess deaths, was vascular disease. And suicide accounted for more than a quarter of the excess deaths. But this highlights the need that there is this health disparity here. And the public health significance of this is important. We can screen for risk factors for vascular disease. We can treat these risk factors. So an important part of managing schizophrenia and bipolar disorder in older adults is, is managing these vascular risk factors, which are something that may make them more likely to die uh, than their non-afflicted uh, individuals. If we look at the treatment of uh, medical comorbidity, Unfortunately, individuals with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are less likely to be monitored for and to receive adequate treatment for medical conditions. So in the case of vascular risk factors, for instance, they're less likely to be screened for vascular risk factors. When those vascular risk factors are identified, 
they're less likely to receive the appropriate treatment for those risk factors. And even when the treatments are prescribed, they may be less likely to adhere to or take the medications as prescribed. And this leads to another important pearl for the management of patients with mental illnesses such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, that you need to make some assessment of their ability to self-manage medications. Cognitive deficits, other symptoms may interfere with their ability to do this. So I encourage clinicians to assess the patient's ability to self-manage medications. If a patient isn't responding to treatment, to consider that maybe this is because they're not managing their medications or taking their medications as prescribed. And when needed, uh, to assist the patient in having resources to manage medications. This may include monitoring by family members, uh, visiting nurse coverage, or a variety of things. But adherence is certainly something important to recognize. So let's talk more about treatments for major mental illnesses in older adults. The available options for the treatment of bipolar disorder in older adults is really the same armamentarium that we have for younger adults. It includes lithium, anticonvulsants, antipsychotics, antidepressants, and we shouldn't forget electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, it has been said that there is a, quote, dearth of literature in elderly individuals with bipolar disorder, unquote. So much of our recommendations that we're going to have for the management of older adults is going to come from data for mixed-age samples. In general, the treatment of acute mania involves antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. And there's some evidence that antipsychotics may be more effective than mood stabilizers for the acute treatment of mania. As far as the treatment of acute depression, it's thought that lithium and lamotrigine monotherapy are really first line. And other treatments may include antidepressants, where the data is um, somewhat controversial and unclear about their effectiveness, with some of the most recent studies suggesting that antidepressants may not be effective for depression and bipolar disorder. Antipsychotics, fish oil, electroconvulsive therapy. You can also consider combination therapy uh, with mo two mood stabilizers or moods, a mood stabilizer with any of these agents. Maintenance therapy. Uh, there's some evidence for mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, but I would argue that the traditional mood stabilizers should be considered first line for maintenance, given that maintenance is often lifelong, and that some of the long-term long -term side effects of antipsychotics, such as weight gain, uh, risk of tardive dyskinesia, increased risk of diabetes, and the like, may be more problematic, though certainly the mood stabilizers themselves uh, have some adverse effects that we need to monitor for long term and, and shouldn't be taken lightly. As far as dosing of mood stabilizers, with the exception of lithium, uh, the dosing range for older adults is similar to that for younger adults. Many have suggested that the dose range for lithium should be slightly lower, in a range of 0.4 to 0.7 milliequivalents per liter. Um, although there is very limited data, as we'll see in coming slides, to support whether or not this is the case. Divalprex dosing ranges vary from what we have here, 65 to 90, um, from this paper to the more traditional 50 to 100 range. Carbamazepine, 4 to 12 or 8 to 12. Lamotrigine, 25 to 400, with most people considering 25 uh, likely too low of a dose. So lithium in older adults uh, is thought to need to be managed differently. First off, the absorption is going to be similar. So the amount of lithium that they take in from the pill that gets into the bloodstream is going to be similar. However, other aspects of the pharmacokinetics of lithium change. As patients age, their volume of distribution decreases. As the volume of distribution decreases, the amount of lithium they need also decreases. Lithium is a salt. It's exclusively cleared by the kidneys, and renal clearance often decreases with age, another reason to use lower total doses. Beyond you losing Beyond using lower total doses for these pharmacokinetic reasons, some have also suggested uh, targeting a lower blood level range, uh, such as 0.4 to 0.7, which is reported in the literature. And the suggestion is, is that older patients may be less tolerant of side effects to lithium. However, there is really no data comparing this range versus another range in older adults, and the clinician should take this into consideration, especially if the patient is tolerating higher levels without side effects. A number of the medications that older patients are often on may interact with lithium in ways that can cause toxicity. 
And lithium has a narrow therapeutic index, and that is that the therapeutic dose and the dose that can be lethal or problematic are somewhat close together, so we need to be careful. Thiazide and loop diuretics, but and also potassium sparing diuretics can increase lithium levels. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs can increase lithium levels. A number of medical conditions, such as congestive heart failure, renal dysfunction, or low sodium uh, can cause increased lithium levels. Lamotrigine is, is a pretty well tolerated mood stabilizer. And in one post hoc industry funded, and this is from the makers of Lamotrigine, analysis of randomized control trial data suggested that Lamotrigine maintenance, when compared to lithium uh, and placebo, significantly delayed time to depressive episodes. And that lithium maintenance significantly delayed time to hypomanic or mixed episodes. And so both of these treatments were effective. You will note here as well uh, that the um, dose range of the lithium was 0.8 to 1.1, which is higher than that that was recommended in the previous slide. And this was a study of older adults. As far as treatment of schizophrenia in older adults, antipsychotics are, are recommended and are, are the mainstay of treatment for schizophrenia. They're often recommended in lower doses because of less rapid metabolism and greater susceptibility to adverse effects in older patients, although, again, studies have not directly tested this. And as far as specifically in the treatment of older adults, there really is no evidence of any antipsychotics being superior to others. In mixed-stage samples, um, there is some evidence that clozapine um, may be more effective than the other uh, antipsychotic medications. Older adults may be particularly sensitive to extrapyramidal effects of antipsychotics, such as dystonia or muscle stiffness. And those who have Parkinson's disease are going to be exquisitely sensitive to these side effects. And so the least prone antipsychotics for these effects are number one, clozapine. It is the least prone to doing this. But it does require weekly blood monitoring in the beginning of, the, of starting the medication for the first six months uh, for agranulocytosis. And so this often precludes its use as a first-line treatment. Quetiapine is the second least likely to cause these extra parental effects and is often considered first line in patients such as those with Parkinson's disease uh, where extra pyramidal uh, side effects are just not going to be tolerated. Antipsychotics are often broken down into two broad classes. First generation antipsychotics which have greater risk of these extra parental symptoms such as dystonia, also greater risk of tardive dyskinesia and second-generation antipsychotics, which, uh, some of which have a much greater risk for weight gain and metabolic side effects such as insulin resistance, risk for diabetes mellitus, increase in triglycerides. There are, are some recommendations that suggest using second-generation antipsychotics as first line, of which risperidone is the only one that's available in generic form. Although the decision of what antipsychotic to use is going to be very much individualized and based on side effect profile in the individual patients. Long-term treatment is required at standard doses to avoid risk of relapse uh, in schizophrenia. For those patients that may be non-adherent, long-acting injectables may be considered. And the antipsychotics that are available in long-acting injectables include risperidone and its metabolite paliperidone, Haloperidol and flufenazine, the first two being second generation antipsychotics, the last two being second generation antipsychotics. As I highlighted before, depressive symptoms are quite common in schizophrenia, and it's often asked, how do we manage these? And these can be impairing and so need to be addressed. There was a randomized control trial of adults over 40 years of age with schizophrenia and subsyndromal depressive symptoms. These were depressive symptoms that didn't meet criteria for major depression. So having two to four instead of five of the major depressive symptoms, symptoms highlighted in DSM. This study found that citalopram, dosed in a flexible dosing schedule of 10 to 40 milligrams a day, was more effective than placebo. And this, this, these findings are highlighted in the figure uh, on the slide. The numbers needed to treat for this difference is approximately five to six, meaning that for every five to six people, that you treat with schizophrenia and these subsyndromal de depressive symptoms, one is going to respond that wouldn't have responded to placebo. 
Let's talk about adverse effects of treatments. I think this is very important. The treatments for both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are not benign and carry with them a significant amount of side effects. However, they are effective treatments and untreated, the conditions are very disabling. So we need to use treatments, but we need to understand what are the potential risks of these treatments and how do we monitor for or mitigate this risk. One of the first things I'm going to talk about is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is a potentially life-threatening, with studies estimating fatality rates of 11 to 38 um, percent reaction to antipsychotic medications. It's important to be able to recognize this. Now, mortality rates are decreasing, and this is thought to be related to improved recognition. So how do we recognize it? The onset is sometimes somewhat insidious or slow, sometimes taking more than a week to develop. Patients may develop a variety of autonomic symptoms, such as fever, tachycardia, sweating, labile or very high blood pressures, increased salivation, rapid breathing, incontinence. GI symptoms such as dysphagia may be present, and, and the hepatic transaminases are frequently elevated. Patients may have a rigidity, often described as a lead pipe rigidity, slow movements, tremors, shaking, and a rhabdomyolysis is a common complication of this. A key feature is altered mental status. Patients will present with stupor, disorientation, somnolence, mutism. As far as laboratory values, we can see elevations in white counts as we mentioned, elevations in transaminases and elevated, crea uh, elevated uh, creatinine kinase, or creatine kinase, elevated um, proteins, signs of renal failure, and patients can even develop disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is a very serious condition, requires hospitalization, uh, quick intervention with supportive care uh, and related treatments. Antipsychotics have also been associated with stroke in some samples of older adults with dementia. This may or may not apply to older adults with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but certainly something we need to be aware of. Uh, the relative risk of stroke has been thought to be approximately 2.7. And in studies of older adults with dementia, 2.2% treated with risperidone or olanzapine, two of the newer or second generation antipsychotics, and less than 1% of those on placebo had cerebrovascular adverse events. There's also been in mixed age samples a link between antipsychotics, both first and second generation, and sudden cardiac death. This recent New England Journal of Medicine article uh, that links it also showed a dose uh, response. That is, at low doses, moderate doses, and high doses, the risk of sudden cardiac death was incrementally increased. So the dose response is somewhat compelling. Anticonvulsants, such as valpro divalproex or valproic acid, have also been associated with fracture, in a sample of older veterans with bipolar disorder. The diagnosis of bipolar disorder itself was independently associated with a 20% increased risk of fracture, and anticonvulsant use was associated with a two-fold increased risk. In mixed age samples, first-generation antipsychotics have also been associated with increased risk of hip and femur fractures. So there are a number of potentially concerning side effects with these medicines that we may need to look out for, although these are difficult things to monitor for. Most of the data that I've highlighted before comes from what we refer to as pharmacoepidemiologic studies. These are uh, post-marketing surveillance studies, often large in scale, often using administrative or claims data. Um, some of these studies have been criticized for failing to adequately address severity of illness and having the potential for residual confounding. But these findings are, 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 are nonetheless quite concerning, and clinical trial data certainly suggests that there are significant adverse effects that we can routinely monitor for. I'm going to now talk about some of these more common adverse effects uh, that we have clinical trial data uh, to support the presence of. Lithium can cause weight gain. Valproic acid derivatives are associated even more strongly with weight gain, as well as insulin resistance and the related polycystic ovarian syndrome. Second generation antipsychotics have been associated with weight gain, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia. It's also important to note that antipsychotics can cause QT prolongation, one mechanism that's thought to potentially link uh, these medications to sudden cardiac death, and especially the first-generation antipsychotic thioridazine and the second-generation antipsychotic ziprazidone. So lithium, how do we monitor for side effects of lithium? It's recommended that before starting or around the time of starting lithium, you obtain a BUN, creatinine, thyroid function, and EKG. Every two to three months in the first six months, 
renal and thyroid function should be tested, and every six to 12 months and as needed thereafter. Now this may be as needed in response to side effects or as needed in response to lack of therapeutic effect. So if the patient is not responding, maybe they're not taking the lithium as prescribed, maybe their level is too low, this would be a good indication for checking a level. Uh, so anytime you're concerned about NAD adherence, uh, lithium levels can be checked. Divalprox monitoring, what's suggested is a complete bud count and hepatic function uh, with transaminases every six months. Antipsychotics, it's recommended that a body mass index be assessed, and some suggest also waist circumference at baseline, four, eight, and 12 weeks, and quarterly thereafter. Fasting glucose should be obtained at baseline 12 weeks and annually thereafter. Lipid profile at baseline 12 weeks, and recommendations vary from two to five years thereafter. I might suggest uh, annually to semi-annually, uh, given that even after 12 weeks, we can see changes in weight and lipid profile. Uh, suggestions related to EKG are varied. Some suggest getting a baseline EKG to make sure that the patient doesn't have prolonged QT before starting the medication. And if symptoms are present thereafter, and symptoms that we would be looking for might be dizziness, syncope, palpitations. Some may get an EKG only if there's a family history of sudden cardiac death, uh, but certainly uh, an EKG is something that you may need to consider, and QT, the QT interval is something to think about. As far as overall conclusions for this talk, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia commonly begin in early adulthood, and though can begin late in life, they persist through life, and the course of illness with these conditions may change, uh, notably with more depressive symptoms in bipolar disorder, less uh, psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia. These conditions are associated with really substantial medical comorbidity that has an, a large impact on patients' mortality. And really comprehensive and integrated medical and psychiatric care uh, is needed for the most optimal and appropriate management of these patients. And treatments are generally similar to young, younger adults. Uh, with the exception, perhaps, of some suggesting a lower uh, blood level target for lithium. And particular attention should be paid uh, to the potential side effects, many of the key ones uh, that we highlighted here, although uh, given the breadth of this topic, we certainly could not be comprehensive in the review of those side effects. But hopefully you feel more comfortable in both recognizing, managing, and monitoring for uh, adverse effects of treatment. Uh, in older adults with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I'd like to review some of the references that are highlighted here, and we'll just leave a few seconds for each slide. Thank you very much for completing this video. I hope it met your needs uh, for your clinical practice uh, and best, best wishes to you in life and work.